The Great Plains in the 18th century, when the first European settlers reached the area, they were convinced that nobody could have lived here prior to the horse. It was a deserted landscape, inhospitable and unsuited for human life. And let's be honest, with hot summers, cold winters, and dry everything, you can see their thinking. But they could not have been more wrong. In fact, even prior to the horse, generations of people had lived here for thousands of years, learning how to live with the land, move with the seasons, and sustain themselves. But who were these people? How did they manage to thrive in the most extreme weather? And how did they hunt? Hi, everyone. This is Travels with an Archaeologist. I'm the archaeologist. Now let's get into the travels. Welcome to Canada, the Great White North, and the country of my birth. And specifically today, we're in Alberta. And heading south along the prairies, past the open grasslands and the wide fields, lies Canada's first UNESCO World Heritage Site, head smashed in Buffalo Jump. It was here that natives leapt bison to their death just on the cliffs behind us. And why was this bison jump in particular chosen to be Canada's first UNESCO World Heritage Site? Well, not only is it one of the largest and most complete in the world, it's also been relatively undisturbed from the time of usage. Not only is this not on any major road, it also does not contain enough materials to warrant the invasive mining that has destroyed so many other buffalo jumps. There were numerous sources of food for the ancient people of the prairies, but none was more important than the bison. The bison was one of those things so central to prairie life that life literally revolved around it. And it was a large animal, leaner than beef, well adapted to survive in both good and bad years, and there was always plenty to go around, or so it seemed. Its hide could be used to make clothes and shelter, the bones to make tools, and the meat from just one animal was enough to feed a small clan. But these were big creatures, with very few natural predators, so killing them was a bit of a challenge. And this ridge presented an easy solution to kill a lot of them very quickly. Now this ridge was used pretty continuously by native groups for over 9,000 years. And although there were a few gaps in occupation, this was in pretty constant use. And why did they choose this spot? Well, let's go to the top and find out. You can see from above, it can have the illusion that the wide, flat prairies just keep going. And while human eyes are quite good for evolutionary reasons involving being able to tell ripe fruit from rotten fruit, a bison is not so lucky. To a bison, this illusion is convincing even up close, and they don't know the prairie ends until their feet are already off of it. And the native groups knew this. They'd hide in the long grasses, making loud noises and starting fires, waiting for the bison to come along until... Boo! Hmm? Ooh. Oh no! I know, right? I expect a call from Pixar any day now. Now there were hundreds of these buffalo jumps scattered all over the prairies, including this one, Old Women's Buffalo Jump, just north of Head Smashed In. And this was how most of the natives got their food. Well, one of the ways anyway. This led to a huge buildup of bodies over millennia and actually altered the shape of the ridge, and that's something I can personally attest to. Now, back in 2016, I had the pleasure of digging here myself. This patch of dirt is where we were. Can I throw up a picture of that future me? Yes, thank you, like that. Now, what this is now, I can tell you from personal experience, this is nothing but bison remains and bones. And as high as this ridge is, it should be twice as high. It's piled up as high as is because this is all the remains. What stands beneath us is 9,000 years of cultural history and bison hunting. But you can still see where the bottom of the ridge should be in this photo, giving you a good idea as to just how deep the deposit of bones goes. Now, depending on which legend you follow, every single bison in the herd had to be killed, either so they could reincarnate, or so the survivors could not tell the other bison about the trap that was going on here. Either way, it left you with a lot of meat to butcher very quickly. As a result, this probably wasn't just one tribe or one clan doing it once a day for every day for food. This was probably a very special occasion done by multiple tribes and multiple groups to get food for everybody. And this also would have depended on conditions. Not every condition is right for a bison hunt. Sometimes it's too cloudy, sometimes it's too snowy. You just can't count on this for how to hunt your bison. So that's probably why these jumps were so special. They were places of peaceful gatherings and friendship, which meant that a lot of these buffalo jump sites were highly sacred. Take old women's buffalo jump. This is where Napi first brought men and women together according to Blackfoot legend. Initially, 
Men and women lived separately, both of them doing everything for each other. And then one day Napi, one of the gods of the Blackfoot pantheon, decided that he wanted the men and the women to live together and split the chores. And this was where the women were doing their buffalo hunt. So he came here in order to get the women to make his proposition. And in this it worked. Men and women did indeed agree to live together after Napi's proposal. But Napi wanted the most beautiful woman for himself and this is where he got a little bit upset. Having snuck into the women's camp to try and determine which one was the most beautiful, he wasted too much time, and the most beautiful women chose other men, and he was the only one left without a partner. Now, according to native legend, he turned himself into a pine tree, and this pine tree is, these days, nowhere to be seen anymore. He did this in mourning of the girl. Uh, sorry, I originally tripped over my words on the first take, and I guess I was too lazy to redo it. Geez, the person filming me really dropped the ball on that, didn't they? But the point is, using a buffalo jump was linked to spirituality, and not a task you did every day, or even every year. But you needed to eat regularly, so you couldn't use these all the time. There were also huge stretches of prairie without such nice ridges, and not all ridges are suitable, as my past self is about to explain. Now not everything that looks like it can be a bison jump site is necessarily a bison jump site. Take this cliff here. It looks fairly suitable, and honestly if you go to the top of it, it looks pretty suitable from the horizon too, causing the same illusion. The problem is you have the river down here, and the river is just not very conducive to bison jumping. And why is that? Because even if the bison doesn't survive the fall, you are going to have to go into that river and fish it out. And now, this is Jumping Pound Creek, but this will connect to the Bow River, and any resident of Calgary will tell you the Bow River has a really strong undertow. You don't want to fish bison out of that river. So what did they do when there was no bison jump or conditions weren't right? This is where buffalo pounds or corrals come in. The hunters would build a large enclosure and, using the same techniques as they did to run the bison off the cliff, they'd instead run them into a fence or other blockade. Sometimes this was handy enough to be built into the natural landscape, but sometimes they'd have to make the enclosure themselves. So these alternative bison kill sites are scattered all over the prairies, like this one in Concord, and believe it or not, this sign is the only archive of it I could find. Now, let's come over here, and if we suspend our disbelief and imagine that the gully behind me, in fact, contains walls or fences of stone or wood or what have you, what you'll get is you'll get a picture of the natives chasing the bison into this area. The bison find themselves blocked off by the fencing, and then the natives waiting right up top there to spear down and kill their bison. And that's how they got the food that way. Now, once they had the bison prepped, with the hide taken for clothes and teepees, the hunters would cook them luau style by digging a hole and slow roasting them in the ground. And you can find the remains of this through fire-broken rocks. These things, which were heated on a fire and then dumped in water to cause it to boil. But this rapid heating and cooling cycle also caused the rocks to crack. See, the outside here versus the inside, the fire has altered this rock's composition. The excess meat would be used to make pemmican, which was a way to preserve the meat and make it last through the long, harsh winters. But who were the native groups hunting here? Well, today, this sits on the ancestral lands of the Blackfoot. However, this hasn't always been the case. Although we don't know the names of the native groups who lived here before the Blackfoot, or what they called themselves, we do know the modern Blackfoot arrived here probably only a few hundred years ago. And this was partially the fault of the settlers. But not in the way you're thinking. Well, okay, yeah, kind of in the way you're thinking too, but not yet. We're talking about the proto-historic period, the time before settlers made actual physical contact with prairie groups. It was actually the horse that altered the lifestyles. The introduction of the horse to the prairies by the Spaniards of the 16th century meant that the landscape of the prairie politics was about to change in a big way. Horses allowed for people to move faster, hunt more efficiently, and carry more of their goods with them. Horses originally evolved in North America, but had gone extinct in the last ice age, meaning they were still animals well suited to the prairies. As a result, the horse was so successfully integrated into prairie life that by the time European settlers arrived, they just assumed the horse had always been a part of it, and that nobody had lived there before the horse had been introduced. Groups moved further and further and fought harder and harder in the days before settlers truly reached the area, and it became common to see horse raids in the 18th century between tribes. As a result of this movement, it can be difficult, if not impossible, to tell who the first users of Head Smashed In were. That's assuming, of course, that any modern group encompasses those ancestors any more than modern Arab-speaking Muslim Egyptians can be considered descendants of their ancient counterparts. Of course, genetically, they can. 
uh, but you'd be hard-pressed to find any unchanged cultural or religious links. And it would be impossible to identify one group of descendants that's kind of more related than the other. This was not the first time people of this region had moved and shifted, either. If we look at this language map, we'll see a mix of all sorts of language families in pockets. And there are dozens of moves across history, with groups being displaced, migrating, and shifting. So, people of the prairies have always been nomadic. That's never been a surprise, and their lifeways have always depended on the migration of the bison, or if they're further north, the caribou. And this may seem rather underdeveloped to settlers, especially to the European ones who were so used to sedentary housed lifestyles. But the fact is, the people who lived here, their lifestyle was perfectly adapted to the conditions. Take the teepee. Teepees are circular, which is the most efficient use of space with the cone shape to trap in heat. This is especially important during those prairie winters, and then of course the hole at the top to let smoke out. This could also easily be disassembled with the poles being used as sleds for the dogs to drag supplies along to a new site. This is built for a life of nomadism, following the bison hunt through the hot summers and the cold winters, and it really was an ideal lifestyle for this type of environment. The people managed to survive here for 10,000 years before the arrival of European settlers when a combination of diseases, colonialist policies, and the gradual eradication of the bison led them to reduced population, living on reservations, and attending the infamous residential schools. And no, I'm not going to talk about those in this video. The introduction of horses and guns were not the only thing that helped reduce the bison population. Settlers themselves did quite a bit of damage as well. Sometimes the settlers would just kill the bison for fun and leave them in the field. By the 19th century, only a few dozen of them were left in the wild. As this pagan winter count records, the bison disappeared from the area in 1879 simply from overhunting. And up in Canada, the settlers were establishing a permanent presence. It was also in the 1870s that the major city of Calgary was founded. Explorers were planning a rail route through the Rockies, British Columbia joined Confederation, and the Americans were in a race to populate the region before the Canadians could reach it, making this part of the prairies all the more important. How could the bison survive in such a climate? Something had to be done, or the bison, once a fixture on this landscape, would disappear forever. Repopulation efforts were undertaken, much of it by these very Blackfoot at this site. And it is one of those rare conservation success stories where bison have now been reintroduced to many of their wild ranges. But it took a lot of effort, and it took a lot of social action from both settlers and natives themselves. It was all the more remarkable that they did this in the 19th century, famously a century where people typically didn't care about extinction or were in the early stages of learning to care about it. Although the bison are not as numerous in the wild as they once were, their population has undergone a recovery and progress is actually being made. Bison are now making a media splash as a leaner, less fatty form of beef, and honestly it's quite a bit more ecologically friendly to this kind of landscape as well. But here on the prairies, we've always known this, and you can still get a bison burger right here at the Interpretive Center. Anyway, that's all I have to say for the bison hunters of the prairies. It's a surprisingly rich and fascinating subsistence strategy that can get quite ignored outside of the prairie neighborhood, but continues to hold sacred traditions and memories for those who still wander these lands, carving out a life from this land of extremes. Sadly, I don't have any more videos on Canada yet. My vacation was actually quite packed with family obligations and non-YouTube concerns, if you can believe that. But I do go back there quite frequently, and I've still got a treasure trove of unused photos and scripts, so this definitely won't be my last Canada video, it's just going to be my last for a while. But as for today, thanks for making it to the end of the video. As usual, if you'd like to support my channel, my Patreon is in the link in the description. Until next time, I'm the Archaeologist, and this has been The Travels.